Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. With me today is Nick Cepedidis. Did I get that right? Tazapsidis. Tazapsidis. Oh, Lord, I got it wrong completely. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and we're going to discuss, he's a researcher, and we're going to discuss drug development research for Alzheimer's. So thanks for joining me, Nick. Thank you very much. Real pleasure being here. So I know you have a family history with Alzheimer's. So why don't we start there? And then you could tell me how that pushed you in this particular direction, because you were in the research field before, correct? Correct. correct. Awesome. So, um, so we were, um, my background is um, that of a biochemist. So we were doing uh, basic research using animal and cell culture models. And we did stumble upon this drug candidate that we are currently exploring. Um, and our intention was to, you know, um, create a, a, a company and raise capital uh, to support the developments, uh, the, the, the de development activities. Uh, in the meantime, my mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and um, she's, she used to uh, live in Greece, you know, we're far apart. Um, I was able to visit a couple of times and experienced the, the rapid deterioration um, that the disease caused. Uh, she, you know, it was, uh, you know, heartbreaking. And I knew um, that, um, I, I sensed that she was also going to be one of those perfect candidates for our therapy because she was losing weight. And one of the characteristics of our approach um, is that it uses leptin um, as, a, as a drug, as a treatment for Alzheimer's disease that are known to have low le levels of that protein. And the levels of that protein are characteristically quite um, um, directly correlated to BMI, uh, body mass index. And it is characteristic for many Alzheimer's cases where they lose weight even prior to the onset of any of the clinical symptoms. So I actually asked uh, her physician to take a sample and ask for them to measure her leptin levels. And I did get a reading in Greece and it was surely at a, the very, at a very low level. So I went over uh, to the time, uh, to the owner of that asset at the time and I could not get permission to get compassionate use of the assets for my mother. Mm. And so what exactly is leptin? Leptin is a protein that our own adipocytes create. Okay. So it's a natural protein. And um, other than metabolic properties, it also has a pro-cognitive profile, meaning that it will enhance your cognition. It will it become a, a trophic factor for neurons and their uh, branches. Okay. And the idea is to um, detect the leptin levels in individuals that are in the early stages of the disease and provide them, supplement them with the protein at the early stage. The idea being the earlier you start with somebody who is confirmed to become an Alzheimer's case, an Alzheimer's case you're more likely to be successful. And um, Anyway, I wasn't able to get uh, the protein and um, we didn't have it. We didn't have clinical grade protein. So we want to continue even more aggressively and passionately now to provide this as a solution for people that are likely candidates to take, to, to, to uh, benefit from its, uh, from its use. At the same time, um, so my mother passed away. Um, soon after, my wife's um, mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. She, in fact, 
um, lived for a longer period with the disease. Her deterioration was a little bit more slow, but nonetheless, they, they exhibited very, very similar uh, uh, profile and symptoms, um, you know, starting from memory loss, um, becoming, um, actually, they didn't have any um, major issues with communicating. However, there were problems with um, reality perception. Um, there was also some paranoia uh, with people that were, you know, close to them, uh, but not necessarily that close. And um, so it's, it's, it's a family uh, personal journey because uh, our daughters have the potential to receive um, a genetic risk from both parents. Not that's that, no fun. <laughs> that's no fun at all. I mean, it doesn't, I mean, the predisposition doesn't mean that you're actually going to get the disease, right? But it just increases your chance of being uh, an Alzheimer's patient. And that's what uh, physicians usually do. The first thing, when you go there, they ask for your family history. They, they want to know who uh, and how close their relative was in your, in your family tree. Um, so direct uh, contact, direct um, relatives. Um, I know that you have also experienced uh, you, you have some history with that. Um, it's all on my maternal side. Right. So hopefully, um, I do take after my dad quite a bit. Personality, I inherited the fat gene from that family. Well, you, you have no signs of dementia, I can tell you that. <laughs> oh, that's good. I, I, I think my mom started about the same age I am now. So I kind of check in. Maybe, yeah, maybe you got... Uh, lucky and didn't get those genes that render you susceptible. I used to get grumpy about the fat gene, but if I got that one and not the Alzheimer's gene, I'll take it any day. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> that must have been interesting as a researcher. You kind of had a little, a little tiny bit of your own in-house subject matter to kind of observe. Did that, did that give you any kind of indications on on anything? I know that's like, <laughs> that doesn't sound like a great question. <laughs> um, b believe me, other than uh, uh, us wanting to execute uh, all activities that are related to bringing that drug to the market, um, being reinforced by, you know, this, you know, family history, um, there's, there's no other plan. There's no plan B whatsoever. That's all I'm thinking since, you know, from the, from the time I wake up until I, I go to sleep. It's, uh, what is it that we need to do to take the next step all the time? Hmm. Well, that's a good, it's a mission. It's a mission. That's always good. <laughs> I mean, my mission was to help caregivers. And now that my mom is gone, I'm, I feel like I'm the caregiver to caregivers. With, who, by by the way, suffer more than the patient. I the agree. Case. We know what's going on the whole time. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's it's more painful. Uh, they're the ones that really have to do the sacrifices. The patients, the patients may not necessarily, you know, fully appreciate what's going around them uh, and what the impact of their disease is to others. Yeah, that's very true. I know I've talked to people who say it was it was more difficult when their loved one was in like the mid stages and was aware that they had a problem, but not able to find a workaround mentally. Like, you know, we all have our challenges. Like I'm not good at math or pronouncing Greek names, obviously. <laughs> so, but I, you know, I'll use a calculator or I'll ask you to, I tried to write it down phonetically as your name, but I still screwed it up. So we have workarounds and people in mid stages can't execute a workaround usually, or it doesn't last very long. And so they're aware they have a problem and that causes a frustration and anger, yeah. all those emotions. And that's harder on the caregivers than like in the later stages when they have no clue how challenging they are. Yeah. Yeah. So, so tell me, 
tell me about the research because I'm I'm always interested, but again, I'm not super sciencey, so you might have to keep it really okay. dumbed down. <laughs> okay, so what we know and, and what you know, most people that are you know looking into these things uh, know is that we haven't had a drug approved by the FDA for Alzheimer's for the last 15 years. A long that was time. The last, that was the last approval for a drug that does very little. But, I mean, it provides a, a, a very short-term symptomatic relief, uh, and in most cases it doesn't do anything. Mm. However, that's all physicians have as a, as a weapon for this disease. It's a, it's, it's a very, very useless. So um, there, there's a great, a huge unmet medical need to find a drug that will minimally slow pro the progression of the disease. And the overall belief in the field is that if we can identify uh, securely those that are indeed Alzheimer's cases in the early stage of the disease, and we identify a candidate drug to treat them with, that's the ideal situation. There's nothing else that would be able to, you know, compete with that. The, 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 there is very little hope, unfortunately, for those that have advanced for the disease. I d there is conceptually, scientifically, um, medically, there isn't anything that can revive dead neurons. And mm. in Alzheimer's brain, there are regions within the brain where 60% of the neurons have died. You know, when, on autopsy, when you do, um, you know, have a, 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 a pathological examination of the brain, you can confirm that a lot of neurons die. Those cannot be revived with anything. The, mm -hmm. I mean, there is some um, uh, uh, how do you call it? Some um, possibility that you can increase plasticity. What I'm referring to plasticity is um, more branching of existing neurons, okay? They, they can keep some of the connections, keep going. And when the, the possibility is that if you find a nice compound that would either maintain or increase those connections or expand those in the uh, uh, live neurons, you might have a good chance of providing uh, some benefit to the patient uh, but bringing up from the dead uh, uh, it, it's it's impossible so you have to work with neurons that are you know still alive maybe not working perfectly and you have to give them a boost that's the idea okay that makes sense yeah and that's the idea and we believe and there's a big group of people uh, that would agree with us that Alzheimer's disease is what is called the diabetes of the brain or type three diabetes. I've heard that term. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's something like they no longer able to utilize energy properly. So we, we strongly believe that it is a metabolic disorder of the brain. And, our, and our compound is something that would um, improve that aspect. We know, for example, that there's a high density of receptors for that protein in the hippocampus, which is an area of the brain that is uh, afflicted by the disease at very early stages that is associated with memory, cognition. Uh, that deteriorates first. The neurons in the hippocampus are the first victims of the disease. And there are... The hippocampus is where the like short-term memories are stored, right? Until they're transferred into long-term memory. Uh, d depending on the region. Okay. Yeah, there's sub subdivisions, subregions. Um, so the protein is uh, generated in adipocytes in the periphery, and there is a mechanism by which it can be transported into the brain, which is a major novel positive aspect of our approach. I, I don't know if you've heard um, 
that there is the blood brain barrier mm -hmm. that prevents most unnatural compounds to go from the periphery into the brain. It's a kind of protection wall between periphery and the brain. And our protein has a natural transporter. We can actually uh, measure the levels of the protein in the periphery and know how much we should expect in what is called the CSF or the uh, cerebral spinal fluid, which a measurement of the levels of the protein indicate how much there is of that protein in the brain. Okay. Those that have low leptin in the periphery also have low levels of the protein in the brain. If you give leptin uh, to, to patients with low levels, the level of that protein in the CSF also increases. So that's roughly what we're trying to achieve. And the strategy involves, you know, identifying people with low leptin levels um, that started experiencing some memory problems or cognitive impairment, you know, defining early stage. And, and, and here, cognitive assessments of the elderly is very important. You know, the, the participatory aspect of patients to be, or those who are you know, concerned about it, is very important. Because then, um, you know, a, a, a deterioration of some of these cognitive functions can be detected very early with neuropsychological testing. And when that is done, you can then do some biomarker readout there's even imaging techniques that can look into your brain that will determine whether you have formed some of the lesions that are characteristic of Alzheimer's disease. And on top of all that, you can do uh, genetic uh, tests. You, you know, a lot of people uh, now have raw data from uh, 23andMe that go and get, right? There's, you know, my, my daughter bought me uh, a kit and, um, she wants to know what my, my genetic background is. But uh, now you can take that data and use it um, to analyze your risk for Alzheimer's. There's a number of markers, or they're called SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, or, yeah, I don't want to... <laughs> like, that one's a <laughs> imagine, imagine the DNA, a big string of billions of... Um, um, Genomes? Spaces. Basis okay. or individual, um, the sequence determines our, you know, genetic predisposition. You know, it depends on what bases you have that will make you likely to be Alzheimer's, likely to be blue eyed, or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, there, it, Alzheimer's is a very complicated disorder, it's not usually a single gene that will predetermine whether you have Alzheimer's. Could be a combination. So you need powerful algorithms or computer programs that will take the, the entire DNA sequence and analyze it based on exactly individual risky genes. Your, your, you know, what, what makes you at risk or not. That's interesting you say that about an algorithm because uh -huh. I just talked to four students from University of Massachusetts yesterday. Mm -hmm. They asked if I could spare 10 or 15 minutes of my time to give some input on their research product or project. You know, they answer questions for them. And I said, trust me, it'll be more than 15, 10 or 15 minutes. I figured half hour, 45 minutes, it was two hours. And they're computer programmers and they're trying to find like a, computer science component to helping cure Alzheimer's. So huh. I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying and I'm remembering what they're saying. I'm like, man, I see this connection happening here and that's really exciting. That, that, that's, I mean, that, that's how um, creative partnerships are, you know, bringing to the table new solutions uh, because if you are always confined with your own, you know, little reality um, and you can't see beyond the box or beyond your reality, 
sometimes you can't see the the, the really breakthrough um, uh, elements that would uh, push your problem to the right direction. And it's, you know, in a way, our field is that way. Uh, what we're doing is um, jumping over different fields, you know, metab metabolic field, working with a, a disease of the brain. It, it's not directly um, something that you will do. Yeah, I'd never heard of it being a metabolic disease of the brain. Yeah, what's the same? Type 3 diabetes is the same thing. You know, the okay. concept of type means this is a metabolic disease of the brain. Effectively, what you're saying. When okay. You say type 3. I'd heard of basically them calling Alzheimer's diabetes type 3 because they feel like... Insulin. Yeah, that lifestyle choices. Like my mom was a major sugar fiend, and she drank two liters of Diet Coke every day. So none of these things are good for you. And her 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 dietary nutrition wasn't great, which was my because my dad was a super fussy eater. So they had a lot of processed food, a lot of basic white bread, mm -hmm. none of the healthy stuff we know we should be eating now. It's very important. Mm -hmm. You are what you eat. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, I, I do. Because I went on a huge weight loss journey, uh -huh. I changed the way I ate, obviously, because I didn't feel like I ate overly too much, but the weight on the scale indicated such. And it took a while to figure out how to lose the weight. How did you? And after I did, did you, did you ask me a question? How did you lose the weight? I went really, really, really low fat, which huh. most people say, oh, that doesn't work. I cannot cut out like the starchy carbs. And I think it's because... It's addictive. <laughs> well, there's that. <laughs> I did switch them all to... Uh, we make our own bread. And part of it is because breads... Like we had a nice whole grain bread with some added nuts and stuff in it. It seemed really healthy. And I think the fifth ingredient was liquid sugar. I'm like, oh, give me a break. It's freaking, and it didn't even have a sweet taste. It was more of a, I really like sourdough. Now we're making our own sourdough too. So we found a wow. bread machine recipe for that. So it's easy. <laughs> but nice. yeah, it was like, I, I went, the recommended daily allowance for fat grams for females is 65 grams. I didn't eat more than 30. I see. So that was really, that, that heart kind of eliminates eggs with the yolk. You can eat egg whites and those are not very filling. So... <sighs> But in, in, I did that to avoid the diabetes that was on my dad's side of the family. And in the last five years, I've realized that by doing that, I probably significantly lowered my risk for Alzheimer's. And I'm much more active and, and I've done a lot of dynamic learning to podcast and promote the podcast. I, I really feel having somewhat changed careers that I've, stimulated my brain yeah 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 I, you know you, the heavier you become it's more difficult to get off your chair it's kind of a vicious circle um and when you lose weight you feel a lot more energized to and you're going to lose even more again you 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 in a way stimulate a positive circle of um things do you do you do exercise too or Physical exercise? Yeah, I used to go to the gym. If you remember in the uh, the old days when we could go to gyms. <laughs> yeah. And we the have three days. golden yeah, we have three golden retrievers, so we walk them. The challenge with that is we have one that's three, one that's almost six, and one that's twelve, and the twelve year old has oh, significant Christ. arthritis in his back legs. So he is very slow, whereas the three year old could run for miles. I mean, I could probably run him on my bike if that wasn't a little bit risky. And so my husband and I do cycling. The cycling is really helpful yeah. for my mental state. Sure. So you get out in the sunshine. And I've had instances where riding my bike, my brain is just poppy with ideas. I had one morning where I was I just, every time I, it seemed like every time I'd turn a corner, new ideas for the podcast popped into my head until it got to the point where like, I can't keep all these in my head at the moment. And it was either stop and dictate all the ideas into my phone 
or what I just did is I just wrote as fast as I could. So I, I was anaerobic, <laughs> which means for people who are not like Nick, a scientist, a researcher, it means you're basically kind of starving your brain a little bit for air. You're, you're really panting hard and you don't have time to think about anything else. <laughs> and I got home and I literally wrote down like six or seven ideas. And I was like, that is the craziest thing. Yeah, yeah. And so it's, you know, my husband and I have worked out situations because now it's just the two of us and the three dogs. So it's like, it's kind of a nice time to talk. And, you know, we talk about his business or my business or, you know, whatever's going on. We have a, time More to time chat to yeah not just in the house i don't know why being outside on the bikes makes it easier to talk but it seems to <laughs> excellent so um um yeah so that's where we are but i mean that that's the the, the conceptual background um uh, as you know clinical development is a very expensive um process <laughs> process uh, etc you, you know clinical trials are the most expensive components of drug development um, not necessarily the longest in terms of time but uh, because the it's the, the preclinical work that is usually the longest when you're you know dealing with gazillion unknowns and you're trying to define what might be you know suitable to get through your filtering um, paradigm because you, you're dealing with a number of candidates that you start you know selecting based on your criteria and you end up with one compound to to get to the point where you're convinced that you should start clinical trials for that single compound um it's the it's it's the most creative uh longest and perhaps um not necessarily that expensive phase of drug development but then you hit clinical trials and then phew, you know, <laughs> from hundreds of thousands it goes to millions it's it, you know it's another order of magnitude more another zero behind the comma right and, yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah so what stage are you guys in just the development first one because yes because um this is a repurposed uh, drug or repositioning drug that is already in the market um, it means that we have a very clear picture about its safety, tolerability, dose, um, route of administration, side effects, if any. Um, and we are uh, in the privileged position to, to say that we're not going to have any problem going from what is called the IND enabling phase, and I'll, I'll come back to that, and through to safety human studies which is the phase one okay so not the ind enabling studies involve um administrating the drug in animals to demonstrate that it is not toxic okay and you get um a, an, an initial picture as to how it's distributed in the body how it's broken down in the body what biological effect it has okay um then you then you have to uh, manufacture your drug in what is called um, a gmp level or i'll call it clinical grade suitable for human use where you have shown that there's no contamination and it's very you know potent and it doesn't break down stuff like that then you submit an application to the fda the food, food and Drug Administration, um, and you ask permission to start clinical trials. You, you give them an idea as to how the clinical trials are going to look. What are you looking for to achieve um, or demonstrate as a, an endpoint that proves that it is uh, clinically important or impactful for the patient, in addition to proving that it is totally safe? Right. Not only you, you can have a very potent drug if it kills after a week, <laughs> there's no use. Right. So that's a, oh, well, yeah, that's a cure, killed, but it cured, cured, cured Alzheimer's. But, you know, the patient always survived a couple of months. Yeah. You don't want that. Um, Is the FDA process very tedious and takes a long time? The FDA, the few interactions that we had um, is always there to support uh, 
you as a drug developer. They're not there to cut you off. They want useful drugs to go through, but they also want to make sure that you're not cutting corners, you're not being cheeky, you're not cheating, et cetera, et cetera. They want to make sure that all this is kosher, okay? And whatever interactions we've had with the FDA, they were just brilliant. They were, you know, very, so I have confidence in the uh, system that has been set up um, that would allow or disallow drugs going through into the market. Great confidence. Uh, they're there to help you rather than cut you. And that's, that's simply the... Uh, well, it's nice the, to the hear best. that it's not a bureaucratic mess. No, and it's, in get, and it's getting better over time. Uh, they, they really have um, uh, managed to streamline a lot of um, um, steps uh, during the process they're reachable um, and and it, it's of course it depends on the company too how well they communicate with the fda if they're predisposition to say oh they're a bunch of bureaucrats and they come down to meetings with that kind of attitude of course they're going to be blocks you know if they start being um abusive insulting to the fda it, that's not going to work yeah you guys are there as a team yes Yes. Makes sense. Yes. So it's a, it's a good, pro nonetheless, you know, <clears throat> the trials are lengthy. So it's not because of the FDA is, is a bastard. It, it, it's, it's the minimum required to demonstrate safety and, and efficacy. And it, the first trial, the phase one is safety with healthy individuals. So you take the drug and you give it to healthy people, see if it, you know, it's toxic or not. The phase two is you give it to patients, but the trial size is relatively small. And then the phase three, after you have decided exactly on the dose, uh, uh, um, frequency of administration, uh, the type of patient or criteria that the patient have, has to have, you do a larger trial. And when I say small and large, the phase two can be 150 patients um, and then the phase three can be thousands can be you know thousand plus and um, th there are special circumstances where the fda would consider uh for example a, a phase two to be sufficient for the drug to be into the market depending on how uh desperate we are how huge the, the unmet medical need is and uh, particularly if there is good evidence to suggest that at least it is safe, it might provide, and we are going for that, uh, a, a door that will allow us to get into the market under the accelerated approval program um, to be allowed to commercialize and to be followed by what is called phase four post-marketing studies. So you can have a drug that's not absolutely fully um, examined or developed under the classical uh, path that the FDA usually requires, but depending on how uh, um, needy we are for addressing that indication, it may approve it at, at, with a, a smaller trial. Nonetheless, under the assumption that there will be a follow-up with real patients in the real world makes and there, sense. there's been it makes a lot of sense makes a lot of sense and we're we're going to try very hard to achieve that that will that will cut um you know the process both time-wise and cost-wise tremendously and that helps to the benefit to the benefit of the patients of course first and all stakeholders of the, of the company of course well, because if you can cut the cost to get it to market, then it will be cheaper to to purchase as a end yes, end correct. user. Correct, absolutely correct. And yes. you all know research isn't cheap, so no. <laughs> but place... cutting, cutting that that phase three trial is going to be huge importance of huge uh, benefits for for the drug and the patients. I can imagine phase three trial might be like herding cats. Trying to keep everybody following the regiment and the protocol and, and well, it's just the sheer number. 
uh, yeah. Cancer. Just the, the sheer number. You're dealing with a, bi a big number. Um, and, you know, uh, our CMO, Dr. Ashford, who's stationed in Palo Alto, um, says there's, there's the secret to a successful clinical trial is RRR. Recruitment, recruitment, recruitment. Oh, uh, referring to recruiting patients for the clinical trial. When you go on a phase three and you need thousands, it's not going to be uh, a straightforward uh, 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 project. It, it will take a long time to recruit all those patients and to keep them on the trial um, for the long period of time that Alzheimer's trials usually require. How long do they usually require? Well, uh, depending on the um, target of the compound that you are developing, um, it could be months, it could be one year. There's trials that have taken four to five years. Yikes. <laughs> one trial. That's, that's a long time. <laughs> yeah. So a company like us would not be able to do that kind of a trial. We would not be able to do a phase three trial going for four to five years. And that's a, a, a substantial argument if we want to see something coming out and test it in the market, it will be the ideal way for everyone. Makes sense. So you're basically going from a different direction than the past drugs they've tried to, or they've created that didn't work, that try to clear out the plaques and tangles, right? You're going a different direction? Um, in, sort of? in a way, yes. Yeah, okay. In a way, no, no, no. It's substantial. That's a very important question. Um, there's two kind of lesions in the, in the brain of Alzheimer's, uh, prominent ones, the plaques uh, and the a beta and the tangles that have phosphor tau. A lot of the trials that have failed recently were targeting those lesions. The idea being they're the culprits, they're the ones that, you know, are killing the neurons, they're the toxic entities. If we remove them, we might give the brain the chance to recover and or halt the disease uh, and the deterioration. Um, we, we don't have a very clear convic conviction about that. We, we believe that they're biomarkers of the process. They're, they're like tombstones of a pathology that's happening in Alzheimer's brains. That, and by removing them, you're not going to achieve anything. They're just, you know, um, not necessarily, they may not necessarily be totally innocent, but they're definitely not culprits. At least the trials that um, fail so far, that's what they prove. That they can't be culprits because they, they've achieved in some of those trials successfully to remove them. Yet there was no cognitive benefit. That must be really crushing when that happens to researchers. Oh, Oh, you're kidding me. It's a, it's a big drawback. And they're very expensive too. We're talking, uh, you know, phase three, phase three trials can go up to a billion. Yeah. The, I can't remember the name of the company who's, they pulled their drug because it wasn't working and they, I think they've, they've done they something different. Pardon bargain, me? Bargain. Yeah. Those they're guys. Still, uh, apparently, they're supposed to be filing for uh, a, an approval. They were supposed to be filing this quarter, the first quarter. Well, we're only in the second. Uh, but now they've changed it to filing later on. Um, there was very minimal improvement. Um, even though they've achieved, they've achieved the removal of the lesions of Ebeda, and yet the cognitive benefit was not there. Not, nothing, nothing, um, impressive anyway yeah that's a bummer it is so, a bummer and and i, I personally I, I say that everywhere in conferences when i present uh, i'm a, a totally against the concept of un, using antibodies um to remove those lesions uh, just as a concept is bad and as a drug category is also bad it's going to be super expensive um, it may have side effects, unwanted side effects, as it has been demonstrated in high doses. It's not going to be patient 
um, friendly. It requires the patient to go to a medical facility to get a, an infusion for an hour or so. Um, I can't remember. It could be more or it could be less, but for a substantial time. But they, ha- they can't do it at home. Right. They cannot administer the drug on their own. And lastly, it will be expensive. Um, and if the payers or the insurance companies that usually reimburse patients for drugs see that there isn't a substantial cognitive benefit, that it's very minimal, they may not even reimburse the patient. So it will be only available to very wealthy individuals who will put their faith in the a very minimum, a minimal improvement due to the removal of a beta uh, with the antibody that Bargen is trying to put in the cow. I could get in trouble for this, but and I don't usually like slagging off anyone who's working in the field because everyone I'm sure are, are behind their product. Um, not only financially but also mentally scientifically medically they're behind the concept and when you tell them you're doing buggery (laughs) by um developing this product you can become an enemy you can become very unpopular at least by by those guys that are backing that compound but at the same time you know to me it's very obvious is it more obvious because they've failed or just because you've approached it differently scientifically? Even if successful, um, the, the financial aspect and the patient friendly aspect are still going to be problems. Uh, you know, it's gonna, not going to be cheaper than no way than 50,000 a year, no way. Hmm. And to do that, for a number of years, because it's going to have to be for a number of years, and see very little in return. I can see if you in had the, in the, the best money. Case scenario. Yeah, I can see if you had the money, you might you might be willing to yes to do it just because yes. you and I know what living with somebody with Alzheimer's is like. But I'm right. liking your just from everything, all the people I've talked to in the last two years. And the research, now I don't read research, I read articles on research because I've tried to read some, what do they call those, the, the, you know, like the summary of research and even those are a little, <laughs> I have to look up a lot of words and I, because I'm, you know, obviously interested in it and it's, it seems like a much more logical approach, but again, I'm an artist, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know too much about the science end of it. So what can people like me do to help you? Did I lose you? No, you're thinking. (laughs) No, no, no. It it will sound, you know, we're we're essentially raising funds now. We we need as much as we can raise to execute clinical trials. That's that's the only obstacle uh, that we're facing right now. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's always money, isn't it? (laughs) Spread the word. Not always. Not always. As you said, the, the wealthy ones may not care if it is 50000 a year, right? And they'll you know, pay out, out, out of their pocket, even if it is a, a small improvement. It's not a money issue for them. But, you know, we're talking about 50 plus million around the globe with those eyes. It's not mm-hmm. a small number. No, and it's, it's increasing. If, if we each of them paid 50,000 a year for five, 10 years, we're bankrupt and there's going to be reimbursement. That is the healthcare system is going to be bankrupt. So we definitely need Not to find only in this country everywhere. Yeah. I know that's the scary thing. It's kind of like this pandemic we've been living through. It's global. It's affecting the whole globe. Some places worse than others. And it's a midget. Mm-hmm. compared to Alzheimer's a midget I keep saying we're going to get somewhere within a year or two with the uh, uh, COVID-19 whether it's going to be something that will stop its um, um, multiplication uh, within your body or even a vaccine uh, I mean it's optimistic that 
too, perhaps too optimistic that we might get a vaccine within a year or 18 months, but it is possible. Uh, people already are enrolling in uh, the phase two trial in some in some cases. So it's possible, you, you know. Um, nonetheless, let's assume it will take two years. Still, it's a very short period of time compared to what it would take any Alzheimer's uh, uh, drug for approval that is starting uh, clinical trials now. It's, it's, you know, we have to focus and support um, with resources, Alzheimer's projects much more than we are doing right now. We can't forget the forgetful uh, because it's, it's a big number. Uh, and it, it will destroy, if you're scared about coronavirus, you know, if you end up with a, and it is a, as you know, a, an increasingly aging society, right? The, mm -hmm. There's more and more elderly. And guess what? More than a third of those uh, of, of the age of 80 and above will get Alzheimer's. This is a, a frightening, frightening figure. Mm -hmm. And needless to say that they're going to need two or three people looking after them. At least. Right. Yeah, I don't know. We got to do something or yep. else we're going to all be taking care of people who can't take care of themselves Yep. or shelling out lots of money to take care, to have them taken care of or some yep. of both like I did. Yep. And it's, it's, it's not a sustainable f economic future for anybody Correct. You know, Correct. globally. Correct. So if somebody's got some extra money laying around and they're like, Oh heck yeah, I'm going to give it to you guys. How do we, how do we do that? Um, call me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can put your email in the show notes. I don't know if you want me to put the phone number in there. Okay, sure. Okie dokie. We are actually right now, um, active with a campaign using net capital as okay. the, the portal and anyone can go to the site register and invest right away in exchange for shares. Um, next month, we're also uh, thinking of uh, joining another uh, platform called Utavi. And um, that is totally focused on accredited investors uh, who'd be able to um, invest a minimum of 100,000. With, uh, with net capital, um, minimum is $2. <laughs> so it's a, a relatively uh, more a little bit different two dollars a hundred thousand <laughs> yes well accredited versus a non-accredited is a is, is a big um, differentiator with the non-accredited um, there is a provision where we can raise up to a million for the company um, and uh, you don't need to check whether they have sufficient financials etc it's a little bit more open to the crowd with the um accredited investor route you you have to confirm that the investor is eligible to put in as much money as we wanted him to you know, <laughs> we want investors to invest as much as possible but there's restrictions and there's rules as to uh, how much they're actually allowed to well, that sounds really exciting. It's, it's kind of, it's a, it's a positive feeling to hear what you're doing and that you're passionate about it and Thank hopefully you. have great success. Fingers crossed. Like, fingers crossed. <laughs> it's like lots of positive energy out there. And, you know, are you guys part, well, will you be part of the Alzheimer's Association trial match when you get to the, the phase two trial? Sure. We actually applied for a grant from the Alzheimer's Association, the, uh, the Gates Cloud, whatever it's called. Okay. I'm part we, of the... We're about to hear in about a week, I think. Uh, nerv That's nervous bad. time now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, email me when you do hear, because if it's sure. a positive, then I will throw it in the show. I'll, I'll throw yes. it in the, at the end. Mm -hmm. And is there anything else anybody needs to know to help uh -huh. you, help themselves? Um, 
you can, they can always visit our website. So there's a substantial uh, body of information about what we're trying to do and generally about Alzheimer's. They can also visit the Net Capital um, page that has the offering. Um, and uh, right now we are renewing both our website and our um, slide deck, um, which we can um, forward uh, to anyone who'd like to see uh, more details about the science. Awesome. Well, I'll make sure both those websites are linked in the show notes so people can just click through, check yep. it out, because this is really interesting. I hope everybody else finds it interesting, and I really appreciate you sharing what you guys are doing, and hopefully some of my listeners can help with the financial end. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. I appreciate you're, it very much. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.